Hey, have you been thinking about putting your own podcast out to the world? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Anchor. First of all, it's completely free, and it gives you all the creation tools that you need to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. You can even add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. Anchor will take care of all the distribution for you, including on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and others. And you can even make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So if you're interested, go ahead and download the free Anchor app today or go to anchor.fm to learn more. The Golf Unfiltered Podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Cog Hill Golf and Country Club. You've heard me talk about Cog Hill every single episode this season, and we will continue to do so because they are one of the premier golf destinations in the Chicagoland area. Featuring 72 holes of championship golf, including the world-famous Dubs Dread, Cog Hill has just upgraded their entire practice academy to include Top Tracer, two bars, a food truck, and a full family experience that anyone will enjoy. Go out to coghillgolf.com to learn more. We are also brought to you by our friends over at WorldwideGolfShops.com. If you're looking to upgrade your game this year, or if you're just trying to pick up some new pieces of golf apparel, or even some training aids to help you score better, WorldwideGolfShops.com has you covered. The best part about this website is they always offer incredible deals on some of the newest equipment, even just days after its release. Once again, it's WorldwideGolfShops.com. Welcome to the Golf Unfiltered Podcast, your source for all things golf, including in-depth interviews, new equipment highlights, and answers to golf questions you might be too afraid to ask. My goal? To help you learn more about the game so you can enjoy it even more. Let's dive in. That's right, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the show. This is your host, as always, Adam from GolfUnfiltered.com. We're back. We took a hiatus last week. Hope you didn't miss me too much, but you know, sometimes we just need a, a week off here and there. Plus, there wasn't too much going on in the golf world, and, uh, you know, we're recharged, and today we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, current events in the game of golf, especially the professional side, as this is the week that Live Golf has visited Illinois. Even though they're calling it Chicago, it is nowhere near Chicago at uh, Live Golf Chicago Invitational, I think is what they call it. But before we get there, just a reminder where you can find me on social media, at Golf Unfiltered. And you can always send me an email, adam at golfunfiltered.com. Thanks to those of you who do. So, as I mentioned, as I'm recording this, on my television, in my office, at home here, I've got round one of Live Golf Chicago on my TV. And I uh, admit that if this wasn't taking place in Illinois, I probably would not be watching it. Uh, This is the fifth Live Golf event. We've talked about Live Golf at length here on the show many times. But I think it's fair to say that we've got a really good picture as to what Live Golf is going to be, at least in the short term. It's not going away anytime soon. We already know that. That's been well established. Many shows talk about it, including here. We also know that more names are likely to make the jump. There are a handful of names currently on Live Golf that aren't going to drive eyeballs to the broadcast. And with additions of Cam Smith, others who have recently made the jump, already adding to the names of the ones that we already know, Bryson DeChambeau, Dustin Johnson, Sergio, many others, Phil Mickelson, of course, Live Golf is probably going to stick around for the next five years or so, in in my estimation. We'll get back to that here in a second now having the opportunity to read a lot about live golf obviously there's a lot of the off course shenanigans that continue to go on the legal battles the the conspiracy theories and whatnot regarding live golf that's all hopefully going to go away at some point not that i disagree with any of those things but i'm kind of sick about hearing about them there's not much happening with it to be uh quite frank. And so focusing on the golf itself, I think that we now have the ability to provide a good, well-rounded, objective level of feedback about what this product actually is. So I had the opportunity to go to this event. It's in Sugar Grove, Illinois. It's about 50 miles outside of Chicago. It's nowhere near Chicago. And, And yes, I know I made a lot of people made jokes about how This is being referred to as Live Golf Chicago, and it's nowhere close to downtown Chicago. 
But that's the case with most golf tournaments. I mean, you're not going to have 18 holes of golf weaving around the Sears Tower, for example. Uh, so, yes, they had to find land nearby, and they just so happened to go to the largest metropolitan city in terms of what they wanted to put in the title. That's that's not new. I chose to not go to this event for a few reasons. One, I just, I'm not that interested in going to a live golf event, let alone something of this nature. And uh, yeah, I guess a little part of me wanted to see, okay, well, what was so new about it? Is it any different than, you know, professional golf events that uh, I've went to in the past, you know, and I'm somebody who doesn't love going to see professional golf live. I, I think that it's just difficult to get around sometimes. And while certainly I've been to my fair share of tournaments, um, it's it the, the viewing experience is just so much better at home for so many reasons and a heck of a lot cheaper. But on that final point, that was actually not the case with, with Live Golf. So as of this morning, and I'm recording this on Friday, again, day one of Live Golf Chicago, they were giving away, uh, basically giving away three-day passes to the tournament for about $9 is what I saw. There was a graphic. Um, I just, uh, I'm hoping that there's some kind of, I don't know, answer to getting people to go to these events if this is to be a sustainable piece of entertainment that the golf world wants to embrace. And I'm not so sure that it is yet. And and I should just say, I should give a caveat here. Uh, by no means do, do I care if Live Golf is successful or not. I, I really don't. I did an episode on this podcast a few weeks ago saying why I think it will succeed. But as somebody who enjoys the game of golf, if this is something that I'm going to need to watch in order to see some of my favorite players then I want it to at least be a little bit enjoyable, even if I'm just watching from home. It is clear that they are struggling with getting people to go to the golf courses. A lot of it probably has to do with the golf courses that they're going to. Now, that may change. Um, This is basically the pilot year, if you want to think of it that way. But I had a friend of mine uh, offer me tickets that were given to him from the mayor of Sugar Grove. And... um, I declined. I just, I have no interest to go and see, despite the somewhat curious nature of, all right, well, how how is the atmosphere? You know, I I just, that wasn't enough of a draw to me to actually drop everything and go and see. So that's a personal choice on my, on my behalf. Now, from a telecast standpoint, I have to admit, it's actually a lot better, not only from the first live golf event, but it's actually a lot better than the PGA Tour. And uh, I have no qualms about about admitting that. I mean, the, the graphics are great. Um, the, the overall on-screen experience, just kind of viewing it, and, of course, the nonstop golf, no commercials, that's, that's always going to benefit the viewer. Um, and I admit that that will probably change as well once, I guess, if and when, Live Golf gets more sponsors. They're going to have to have commercials of some sort. I don't know how they're going to handle that. Their broadcast team is going to have to get creative. If one of the major draws here is that you've got 50 on-course cameras, which is a mountain more than what they have at a PGA Tour telecast, uh, operating all at once to give the viewer as much golf as possible. So that's pretty much where my interest of Live Golf ends, as far as what we could see right now. We know who's playing, we have an understanding of the format, and we also get a pretty good telecast. I would say it's actually really good uh, compared to the alternative. So those are the things that, that, in my view, we know for certain. There are many questions that remain unanswered, and this isn't an exhaustive list, but these are a few that that pop to the top of my mind as far as, okay, what is actually happening here with Live Golf? Where is it going to go? And I admit and, of course, acknowledge that there are answers to these questions that will likely come in due time. But 
they still remain. The questions are still there. So let's let's go into them one by one here a little bit. I guess the biggest question that I still have is what's the actual point of live golf? That is that is still something that is not 100% clear to me. I know what we've been told by the players in press conferences and what the the PR speak says. But that has even shifted over time. For the longest time, it was all about, oh, more time with my family. And yeah, the money thing was nice, but playing less was a major draw for a lot of these players. But we also know that that's not entirely the case for everybody because of the lawsuits that have followed and the push by a lot of these players to actually play more golf to get world ranking points. That was evident at the unfortunately shortened Uh, BMW uh, PGA Championship uh, hosted by the DP World Tour. A lot of players from Live Golf still played in it, much to the chagrin of other players who were in the tournament, so they could get world ranking points. But for me, it seems like the messaging shifting, the speaking points changing, and as more players come on to Live Golf, Everyone's going to have different reasons for doing it. I I fail to believe that all of these PGA Tour players are making the jump for the same reasons other than money. If that's even true, let's just say for the sake of this uh, monologue that you're listening to, that that is the case, that everyone's got their own individual reasons, uh, but money, the, the massive amount of insane dollars that are being thrown around at these players is the the common thread among them all. I still contend that there's really nothing wrong with that in theory. But of course, everything else opens up and then it's, all right, well, where's the money coming from? The Saudi Arabia uh, government fund, all, all of those things come into play here. And then it becomes a matter of opinion. You know, opinion insofar as how you, whether or not you feel that that is morally or ethically right for these players to to accept the money. And you all know where I stand on that. So if this is truly just a place for these players to play and to get a massive payday, is that sustainable? So I guess that's kind of like a secondary question to my original question. What is the point of Live Golf? This becomes even a bigger issue if no TV deal is solidified for live golf we're hearing all these things and greg norman says a lot of nonsense let's just call it what it is i mean yes that's subjective what i just said but he he says a lot of things and not many of them turn out to be true the fact that he mentioned in a recent uh interview on espn 1000 here in chicago that there are four networks basically battling it out to try to see who wins live golf uh, that's that's probably not true and if they are I, I would love to know who those networks are because we're already hearing Apple TV, Amazon, CBS, NBC, Fox, all of them, ESPN, they've all said no. The ones that remain, well, depending on your political affiliation, uh, there there's some interesting acronyms that are still available and uh, it would just be a comedy of errors if uh, one of those networks ended up picking up live golf that that would not be a good business decision for them in my opinion but i digress of course the one thing that would help a tv deal would be what is the point of live golf you know if that was actually defined it continues to go back to that original question i had and something that helps solidify some value of live golf or for live golf would be world ranking points so that is another major question what's going to happen there Earlier today, uh, I believe Bryson DeChambeau mentioned something regarding, you know what, there might be some tweaks to the format. Uh, Right now, of course, Live Golf being a 54-hole event, shotgun starts, all that thing, all these matters, uh, no cut, by the way, uh, none of this falls under the official World Golf Ranking um, criteria in order to earn World Ranking points. Will Live Golf make changes enough so that it is still... A, a attractive alternative to the PGA Tour for the players, while also meeting the criteria for the official world golf rankings. At some point, unless I'm missing something, but at some point it just becomes another flavor 
of the PGA Tour. It's just got a lot more money and a lot fewer sponsors. So if you're a pro golfer and you see these two, and it, it, let's just say all of that happens, that this really, that live golf truly just becomes the same, let's say it's 72 holes, there's a cut, and it's just a smaller field in comparison to what the PGA Tour is with all the history and all the, the courses and the legacy and all that. And really it just boils back down to the one thing, and that is money. If you're a player, you're probably going to still lean towards the place that's going to pay you more, I would think, unless your players like Will Zalatoris, John Rahm, Rory McIlroy, Tiger Woods, all these other well-known players on the PGA Tour who have said, no amount of money will convince me to jump to live golf. So I guess saying all of that, we really just come back to status quo. There is no major change world ranking points just might get awarded. Well, if that happens, then another question pops up. How many world ranking points will be awarded? You see, the strength of the field matters for world ranking points. Now, this week, specifically when I'm recording this episode, I would agree that Live Golf has a better field in terms of strength of field than what the PGA Tour is putting out at the Fort... Is it Fortnite? Fortnite Championship? I don't know how to say it. Um, That is true. There are more recognizable names playing in Chicago than at the PGA Tour event. But that isn't always the case. And if Live Golf decides that they want to grow and they want to host more tournaments throughout the year, which is what they are saying they are going to do in 2023, I believe they're up to 15 more often than not, they're probably going to, despite their best efforts, they're going to run into some of the higher profile PGA Tour events, especially two or three years down the road, and if they continue to add events on Live Golf. It's just almost unavoidable. So then it becomes a matter, and let's just assume that the PGA Tour and Live Golf, they they work something out. I, I don't see that happening, but let's say that they do where players can kind of jump between the two tours. Well, if you're an individual on either of the tours, you're going to have to make some really interesting decisions. Where do you want to get more world ranking points? And whichever tournament or whichever tour offers the most, it might not be the tour that offers the most payment. So therein lies a really confusing option. It's almost like a Sophie's Choice for for these players. What do you choose to do in terms of your career? Now, of course, as we know, the PGA Tour has responded recently with changes to its own structure and its prize uh, money as well as the player impact program, but it still pales in comparison to what's available on the Live Golf Tour in the uh, Saudi Arabia's public investment fund. That's just never going to be a comparison. So in many ways, there has to be a lot more progression, not only with the golf itself on Live Golf, and perhaps even on the PGA Tour. Let's be fair, there may be a few things that the PGA Tour learns from fan engagement as well as feedback uh, from what Live Golf does that the PGA Tour chooses to incorporate into their tournaments. I wouldn't hold my breath, though. And of course, all the questions regarding the world ranking points, Whether or not they're going to be invited to majors, all of that has yet to be seen, although I would wager that the Open Championships, the U.S. and, of course, the British, are still going to allow them to attend. And, frankly, I think the Masters is still going to allow past champions to attend. I'm about 60% sure on that one, um, because they definitely don't like any drama or controversy at Augusta National. Now... Besides all of that, perhaps there's a bigger question that has to be answered. And this is territory that I've tried to not tiptoe too much into while talking about Live Golf. But at some point, we kind of have to call it out because now television networks are declining Live Golf because it is too toxic. There is a lot, a lot of bad press surrounding Live Golf, including world events. And 
we can't hide from it. We can't put our hand, uh, heads in the sand and just ignore and pretend that it's not happening. It's out there. And it really came to a head when Live Golf visited a Trump golf course. There's no way around it. Coupled with that and all of the bad press that's going around that guy, there's the entire human rights that's been there the entire time regarding Saudi Arabia and their abysmal record on human rights. Now, no matter what you think, whether you're a supporter of Donald Trump or if you're uh, looking past all of the atrocities that happen in Saudi Arabia, and perhaps you're one of those people that like to throw out the, well, if you put gas in your car, it's a completely different argument, but I won't cover that here in this episode. No matter where you fall anywhere on those spectrums, the point is, it is not an attractive thing for sponsors and television networks to latch on to. It just isn't. There's also rumors swirling, and I don't want to feed the rumors here. I'm just going to report on things and, and comment on things that I have seen from reputable sources. There are elements of an ongoing investigation by the Department of Justice here in the United States regarding Donald Trump and certain documents that he should or should not have had in Mar-a-Lago. There are other elements that tie his son-in-law to Saudi Arabia, and then suddenly Live Golf appears. Now, I understand that I have a very diverse audience. I know that there are many of you who are on a different political spectrum than I am, and this is not a politics podcast, but I hope that you can understand that we can't not talk about this regarding Live Golf, regarding the people that are tied to it, and just pretend that it's not there. Now, I have no idea how any of those elements outside of golf are going to finalize. I don't know if anything's, anything's going to happen uh, with the Department of Justice investigation or anything else. The Saudi Arabia thing is never going to go away unless that kingdom decides that they're going to change an entire history, which how can you even do that? And I don't think people would even look past that, even if they could. No matter where any of that shakes out, it still means that people are going to be hesitant to watch. It's going to be difficult to secure sponsorship, and it's going to be difficult to profit if you're Live Golf. Now, I guess to summarize all of that into an actual question statement, can Live Golf overcome its toxic and negative persona? That remains to be seen. Certain things, I believe, could happen if they wanted to, if Live Golf decided that they wanted to completely separate from that persona, then they need to make a conscious effort to do that. And I believe step one would be to get rid of Greg Norman. This is a guy that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with United States politics or anything that Saudi Arabia does, but he is not just a lightning rod for negative press. He has not done a good job as a CEO or whatever his official title is at Live Golf. And I believe that they would probably say the same. He's gotten it off the ground. He's helped. I don't even know if he could say he's helped. He's definitely uh, attended interviews where he has put his foot in his mouth many times. And it's no secret that he hates the PGA Tour. He has a bone to pick with them. He's got a chip on his shoulder with the PGA Tour. He needs to go. If Live Golf wants to be taken seriously by the widest audience possible, I believe they need to separate themselves as much as they can from any of that other nonsense that I just discussed earlier, whether you agree with it or not. I would hope that we would agree that it's just not the time to link golf to any of those things. I mean, hell, there are people probably listening to this, and I know I've gotten the emails and the commentary on social media that tell me to just stick to golf. And obviously, I don't listen. <laughs> but now is the time that Live Golf probably should focus on everything golf related and nothing else. Now, yes, the media likes to build a narrative. Yes, there are people who will talk about all those things that I mentioned earlier uh, until they run out of breath and even a little bit after the fact. 
That's okay, though. That happens all the time. New cycles reboot. People forget things. It happens all the time. So those are a few of the questions that still linger for me. I am encouraged to see better players, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I'm I'm encouraged to see that the product of golf is getting a little bit better on live golf because at the end of the day, as fans of the game, we want to see good golf whenever we can. I personally would prefer to see it on the PGA Tour. Yes, that's because that's what I grew up with. That's all I've known. I'm not resistant to change as a golf fan. If anything, I believe I'm pretty progressive in that regard, as long as what's being offered is worth my time. I would say five events in Live Golf isn't my preference yet. Uh, I don't know if it ever will be because of all that other ancillary stuff that I mentioned earlier, but they have an opportunity to fully separate themselves from all of that. And I do believe that if they really want to be taken seriously and if the PGA Tour wants to take them seriously, and obviously they are because they view them as a viable threat, they need to partner together. And I believe that that can happen and probably should at some point for the betterment of pro golf. My apologies for the barking in the background. If you heard that, that is Thor, our uh, head of GU security. You've seen him on social media. So that's uh, that's the show for this week, folks. Let me know your thoughts on the whole thing. I know I tiptoed in some waters that I try to stay out of, but you know what? As I mentioned, we kind of still have to talk about this stuff. It's not like it's not there. And uh, I'd love to know your opinions on everything. Uh, well, there's Thor again. Apparently, he wants to know too. Hit me up on social media at Golf Unfiltered, and you can send me an email, adam at golfunfiltered.com. We'll be back again next week. Um, not sure if we'll have an interview yet, and we're trying to set one up. But uh, keep the topic ideas coming. Let me know what you want to hear. And thanks, as always, for your support. And if you don't subscribe to us already, please do so. We have a YouTube channel out there as well where you can catch some of our greatest interviews that we've done uh, and some of our not-so-great ones, I would say. <laughs> hey, you know what? Just being honest. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back again soon. 